Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Loic Kroon and I'm speaking from the Department of Neurology at Steve Beaker Academic Hospital and I will be giving the talk today about strokes. So this is the outline of the talk that I'm going to have. I will cover the basics of stroke and TIAs, then I will take, take us through the mimics and chameleons of TIAs and strokes, as well as some of the pitfalls in misdiagnosis of these conditions. This will be followed by a look at the best medical care and what impact it has on stroke management and prevention. This will cover some of the latest trials. Lastly, I will end with acute stroke management and the big landmark trials that we currently have in acute stroke management. The way that I'm going to arrange this talk is that I'm going to discuss the related topics adjacent to a case study. So we'll start off with Mr. Z, a 69 year old man with a history of hypertension, who developed a sudden onset of right face and arm weakness and an aphasia upon awakening this morning. The symptoms seem to be improving after an hour or so and had almost completely resolved by the time his son came into the room. But when he told his son about the symptoms, his son, who had just read a newspaper article about how to recognize stroke symptoms, advised him to seek medical attention right away. So they decided to take him to his nearest healthcare professional, which is obviously going to be you, fortunately. So to get started, I'm first going to look at a quick definition of stroke, as it is defined as being an acute focal neurological deficit of the CNS due to a vascular origin, thus including ischemic and hemorrhagic etiologies. As we can see, it's a syndrome that is a collection of clinical characteristics which form a pattern. The term focal refers to those symptoms or signs which reflect this function of part of, part of the brain, which refers to all parts of the cerebrum, including the cerebral hemispheres, midbrain, brainstem, as well as the cerebellum, as well as the spinal cord and optic nerves. The term vascular origin means that the syndrome is due to a blockage or rupture of blood vessels. When a blood vessel blocks or ruptures, it is not surprising that the symptoms or signs come on rapidly, usually over seconds to minutes. TIA is classically being defined as having symptoms that results within 24 hours, but an updated definition is currently required as we see that TIAs lasting more than an hour already show signs of an infarct on MRI studies, which I will discuss later in my talk. Just to highlight the mortality and burden of cerebrovascular disease in South Africa, this is a table listed in Stats SA, which was published and as we can see, vascular diseases account for the second highest impact on mortality rate in South Africa, just next to infectious diseases. And when we look at the subcategories, cerebrovascular incidents account for the fourth highest cause of mortality. So as I mentioned, stroke is defined as being sudden onset of focal neurological dysfunction and this dysfunction is going to be a stroke until it's been proven otherwise. There are two kinds of strokes that we talk about. There's an ischemic stroke due to a blocked blood vessel that leads to a lack of blood flow, which accounts for about four-fifths of strokes. And then there's hemorrhages due to rupture of blood vessels, which account for about one-fifth of stroke. This leads to the concept of an ischemic core, which is the area of irreversible damage in an isch in ischemic strokes, followed by the ischemic penumbra that is said to have selective perseveration. It is neither dead nor alive, but by optimally restoring blood flow to this area, we can save it, and which is this area which is at risk for infarct progression. So looking at the different kinds of strokes, we can see we have ischemic strokes, as I've mentioned, that are due to a blocked blood vessel that can either be due to an arterial or venous sinus thrombosis. And then we can have causes of arterial strokes, which vary, and they're roughly equal cardioembolic, large vessel, small vessel, or other causes that are more rare. And then for hemorrhagic stroke, they can be either intracerebral or intraparenchymal, which is most commonly due to hypertension. But in the older population, it can be to amyloid angiopathy, which becomes more prevalent. And in the young population, there are structural causes that are more prevalent, such as AVMs or AV malformations. And then there is subacmural hemorrhages, which most commonly is traumatic. But if it's non-traumatic, they can most often be due to an aneurysmal in etiology. So moving on to stroke care, the obvious goal is to minimize brain injury and to maximize the patient's recovery. So in the hyperacute stage, the aim is to focus on salvaging brain tissue, 
which is quite an exciting area of stroke as there are a lot of new and exciting developments happening. So in the acute stage, the focus is to maintain medical homeostasis, minimize complications and doing an etiological workup and then doing the sec relevant secondary prevention, which plays a particularly important role in transient ischemic attacks. The post-acute stage is to maximize neuroplasticity, to develop adaptive strategies for those that are left with deficits, and the aim here is to reintegrate the patients back into society. So as we can see, there are various aspects of stroke care which overlap with multiple disciplines. Therefore, it's important to maximize collaboration in order to prevent patients from falling through the cracks. So as we can see, Mr. Z, our patient, can fall in any one of these four categories. So when we look at the NINDS, or National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, we can see time is brain. Every minute in which a large vessel ischemic stroke is untreated, the average patient loses 1.9 million neurons, 13.8 billion synapses, and 12 kilometers of axonal fiber. Each hour in which treatment failure fails to occur, the brain loses as many neurons as it as it does in almost three and a half years of normal aging. Therefore, a rapid triaging system with good diagnostic accuracy is important. And this is where the ADs of stroke care highlight the major stems in diagnosis and treatment of stroke in the out of hospital as well as in hospital setting. So as Mr. Z came to our practice, he obviously falls in the out of hospital setting. So patients with an acute ischemic stroke have time-dependent benefit of, for fibrinolytic therapy. So from new data and published guidelines, we now have up to nine hours from time of, sim time of symptoms onset in selected patients for giving TPA. Therefore, it is possible to help these patients, even Mr. Z, which is our patient. There is, therefore, it is important to act fast with a special em emphasis on the face, arm and speech test which is rapid assessment with a good sensitivity for detecting strokes in the pre-hospital setting. So looking at this plethora of stroke scales that have been developed for the purpose in recognizing strokes or TIAs in the outpatient setting, I'm going to look at some of the following scales, namely the FAST, the NHISS, Cincinnati, Rosier, as well as the ABC2, CD2 scale. As we can see, all of these scales have very fun mnemonics that makes it really easy to use them. The recognition of stroke in the outpatient basis was just developed to facilitate rapid stroke patient identification. The best studied scale for stroke diagnosis is the face arm speech test or FAST as well as the Cincinnati stroke scale. The face arm speech test or FAST has a T in for a reminder for the importance of time and the need for TPA if the patient presents within nine hours. It evaluates patients with suspected stroke by assessing them for the presence of speech impairment, facial weakness, and arm weakness. The Cincinnati Hospital Stroke Scale focuses on the assessment of facial paresis, arm drift, and an abnormal speech. In a prospective report evaluating the Cincinnati, the diagnostic accuracy for emergency department physicians compared to stroke physicians was similar with a high correlation for total score between these two groups. The presence of an abnormality of any of the, the three stroke scale items was associated with a marked increase in the likelihood of stroke. So this is a comparative study in which 860 stroke scales were correlated on 171 patients. It was reported that the Cincinnati stroke scale had an excellent reproducibility among physicians, and it was noted to have a good validity in identifying patients with stroke who are candidates for thrombolytic therapy, especially those with anterior circulation strokes. So you may ask which scale is the best for stroke identification? Well, in this comparative study published in 2010, it showed that the Cincinnati compared well to the FAST as well as the ALA pre-hospital stroke scale screen, which were equally effective when using the combined item set, which had a 95% sensitivity as well as an 83% specificity in identifying a stroke. Another test is called the Rosier, which stands for the recognition of strokes in the ER, which is published in the Lancet in 2005. 
but it had the same sensitivity and specificity as the FAST and the Cincinnati score. It includes the face, arm and leg weakness and with, with speech of, and visual field defects. But something that is nice of this scale is that it includes scores that could help you to identify stroke mimics, namely a loss of, un, loss of consciousness or the history of a seizure. It's important to remember that that doesn't mean that a stroke can't present as a seizure, but that a seizure could increase your chance of having a mimic. The cutoff point for this is, scale is 1. The higher the score, the more likely the chance of having a stroke. Okay, so let's get back to our case, Mr. Z. You decided to perform a Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale on him and you're not really picking up any abnormalities. Maybe you can convince yourself that he has a slight pronated drift at 30 seconds with some residual word finding difficulties. So nothing that is really shouting or screaming out at you that the patient is having a major stroke at this stage. So let's look at TIA, which is short for transient ischemic attack. I think we all know that a TIA is a major risk factor for the development of a future stroke, with the greatest risk occurring in the period immediately after the TIA. It is known that about up to 25% of strokes are actually preceded by a TIA. Therefore, it is especially important to recognize patients with symptoms of a TIA, because treatment such as antipatrian therapy substantially in reduces the risk of an early recurrent stroke. In 1975, the NINDS gave a classical cl clinical definition of this disease. They defined TIAs as an episode of temporary and focal cerebral dysfunction of vascular origin, which are variable and in, uh, in duration, commonly lasting from 2 to 50 minutes, but occasionally lasting as long as up to 24 hours. They leave no persistent focal neurological deficits, and this definition gives us some clearness but also leaves a space for interpretation and also for variation in presentation. The diagnosis of TIA relies on the patient's description of symptoms and on the ability of the clinicians to interpret them correctly. However, this is not always easy. Several studies have shown that even the agreement between clinicians regarding the diagnosis of TIA is only moderate. As this study from 2010 found, this is true even in stroke trained neurologists. So even for specialists, TIA might be highly subjective. So why is this? And this might be explained by, even though there is a high level of definition for TIA, this definition gives us no guidance on which symptoms are likely to be vascular in origin. Therefore, the diagnostic criteria from the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke were developed by an expert consensus to aid clinical practice and recruitment into research specifically criteria that differentiate between classical TIA symptoms on the left and the so-called non-consensus TIA symptoms on the right. As we can see for the consensus criteria, the classical TIA symptoms are predominated with a loss of functioning or negative futures, like a loss of power, sensation, balance and speech, as well as vision, so on and so forth. The consensus criteria for TIA symptoms are thought to often have a non-vascular cause and typically have associated features described by the five Ds of diplopia, dysarthria, dysphagia, dizziness, as well as dystaxia, commonly seen in posterior circulation pathology or even in mimic disorders. It is also important to remember that the consensus definition of stroke or TIA is acute focal neurological dysfunction with a vascular origin, with emphasis on acute or sudden. These symptoms are also typically focal, and these patients typically do not have a gradual development of symptoms, expanding over hours or days. It is also not generalized, like what we see with fainting or blackouts. These symptoms might warn you of underlying differential, like an epileptic syndrome, migraine or syncope, but not a typical presentation for stroke. The negative symptoms, like weakness, numbness and a loss of vision, are typically characteristic of ischemia and infarction, as opposed to the positive symptoms, which are associated with involuntary movements, tingling sensations and flashes of light or photo phot photopsias, which is seen in conditions like a migraine and seizure phenomena. This symptom complex is really helpful in differentiating a stroke from other conditions. So how about symptom duration? 
Transient spells of longer duration and those accompanied by focal weakness might be more likely to cause new ischemic brain lesions in patients with a clinical TIA, which imaging studies have shown which can be appreciated on these graphs. As we can see on the graph on the right, more than half of the patients who meet the criteria for a TIA, whose symptoms duration are longer than an hour, already show signs of an infarct on imaging, therefore making the classical definition of a TIA almost obsolete as it already caused irreversible ischemic lesions. And since the incidence of cerebral ischemia increases with age, as well as in patients with diabetes and hypertension, information concerning these, fa these three factors are also used when used to prognosticate patients who suffered from a TIA. So why is it important to make the diagnosis of a TIA? And as we can see from this table, that close to 10% of these patients will go on to develop a complete stroke within the next 90 days. But the risk can be even go as high as 40% depending on the associated risk factors, which are listed on the, side of the, on the slide on the right. These risk factors play a crucial role in the progression to a complete stroke. One important fact that I want to highlight is that it's really important to remember that a TIA is a sign of pending doom. The patient is likely going to have a stroke in the coming days to weeks. These patients don't get more than two TIAs. A person who suffers from one TIA, if they are fortunate enough to outlive a stroke, they might get a second TIA. But the moment you go on to get more than two TIAs, it really becomes important to think of a differential, like focal seizures with residual totsperesis, or another mimic disorder. So highlighting the importance of these risk factors, we can see that since the 90s, many attempts have been made to satisfy the risk of stroke after a TIA by creating and validating risk assessments to evaluate especially the short-term prognosis after a TIA. Two of these scores are shown on this slide, the California Risk Score as well as the ABCD Risk Calculation. Patients are giving more points with more specific symptoms and longer symptom duration. Therefore, as I mentioned, placing them into a higher risk category for a possible risk of stroke development in the coming days. So in an attempt to improve on this scoring system, the ABCD2 score was developed, which includes diabetes as a fifth element. The ABCD2 score was validated in four independent cohorts. The results are given on this slide. On the graph on the right, you can see that with higher scores, there is a higher two-day risk of stroke development. According to this consensus, we can see that the ABCD2 scores of lower than 4 are considered low risk, and a score of 4 would be considered as being a moderate risk, and 5 or more considered as being high risk. So there were even further attempts to improve on the scoring system, namely the ABCD2 classification with an additional I for neuro imaging, and then ICA stenosis and a second TIA was added to the list. But these additional scoring systems are more impractical because they merely serve as a risk classification screen to highlight the urgency for referral for further workups, like an angiography. So adding an MRI or CT scan even granted studies to measure the flow velocity to the risk classification system already means that the patient is undergoing a workup. So therefore, it is a little bit of a redundancy to include these additional scores. Nevertheless, as you can see here, several guidelines recommend immediate referral for an urgent, urgent specialist assessment. But there are some problems to these guidelines, as well as the more universal ABCD2 scoring system, which I'm going to highlight now. In 2012, Marenko and his group showed a prospective cohort of almost 1,780 patients. In this study of patients with TIAs who scored less than 4 on the ABCD2 system, showed that the 90-day stroke risk rate was 3.4%. In the high-risk patients, it was 3.9% in, in patients with a score higher than 4 and additional criteria for emergency treatment. On the bottom of this slide, ICA stenosis, intracranial stenosis, or major cardiac sources for embolisms are, are criteria that warrants urgent referral, work, referral and workup. The authors concluded that whenever possible, that all patients with TIAs should be evaluated without delay, regardless of the ABCD2 score, as these three major sources are possibly preventable. Furthermore, a recent study published in The Lancet some weeks ago focused on the non-consensus TIA symptoms, 
Remember I showed you the distinction earlier in the beginning of the presentation and they found that these patients with the non-consensus symptoms are at a high early and long-term risk of stroke and have cardiovascular pathological findings on the investigations similar to those seen in the classical TIA patients. So I now want to quickly look at some of the new and exciting TIA guidelines published by the European Stroke Organization. Here are two of the recommendations concerning a TIA worker. So recommendation one is for patients with suspected TIAs. They suggest that not to use a prediction tool alone to identify high risk patients or to make a triaging and treatment decisions, which you already know from that study conducted as far back as 2012. As the quality of evidence for those prediction tools like the ABCD2 score is really low and the clinical judgment, patient history and having a high index of suspicion triumphs. The second one is that an expert consensus statement saying that in patients with a suspected high risk TIA, all experts suggest that prompt review by a neurologist or hospitalization in a stroke unit for workup are reasonable options. Here's an example of what a dedicated TIA protocol looks like. The protocols selected here include brain imaging and selected patients where the symptom duration lasted longer than 60 minutes, which is supported by that level of evidence where more than half of the patients demonstrated ischemic changes on neurological imaging. Vascular imaging, cardiac monitoring should also be obtained as symptomatic internal carotid artery stenosis as well as cardiac embolization, which are potentially preventable causes should promptly be identified. Expanding on these protocols, the following admission criteria are indicated. Patients should be admitted for prompt evaluation if they had a higher than 50% stenosis of the blood vessel. That might expand their symptoms, make it, making it a symptomatic internal carotid artery stenosis. If they had ischemic lesions on MRI, or if they had more than one TIA in the past month, being medically unstable or showed ischemic lesions on the imaging studies, and most importantly, if this workup can be obtained effectively and easily as an outpatient, these patients should be admitted for further workup. Again, like the ABCD2 score, we can see here that the criteria is a little bit counterintuitive because most of the admission criteria stipulated in here is the reason why we want to admit these patients. So if it's necessary for workup for a TIA patient, it's limited by resources or time constraints, they should be admitted for this workup urgently. So let's get back to our case, Mr. Z. You decided to use the ABCD2 score on him and you calculated his risk score to be about 6. He scored 1.4 having an age of more than 60, 1.4 having a blood pressure of more than 140 systolic, 2 points for having unilateral weakness, and 2 points for having a duration of lasting more than 10 minutes, corresponding to a high risk of stroke. So you decided to refer him for admission and further workup. Now the big question is, is there any treatment that you can initiate in the meantime while he is awaiting his stroke workup? So I quickly would like to first look at the major causes of ischemic strokes and TIAs, and that would be extracranial atherosclerotic carotid disease, ranging from, the, from about 10 to 35%, depending on the method of etiological classification and population-based studies. This serves as a major indication for workup in these patients. Atherosclerotic carotid stenosis most commonly occurs at the carotid bifurcation, involving the distal common and proximal internal carotid arteries. However, it can also affect the origin of the common carotid artery as well as the cavernous segment of the intracranial carotid artery. The prevalence increases with age and is higher in men. It is known that about 20% of these patients will suffer a warning TIA before the stroke occurs. Two large randomized control trials have demonstrated the benefit of carotid endorectomy in symptomatic stenosis. The so-called North American Symptomatic Carotid Endorectomy Trial, as well as the second asymptomatic carotid surgery trial. In these studies, the benefit of, the, of intervention is highly dependent on the degree of stenosis. So let's look at the degree of stenosis and when surgical intervention with carotid endorectomy is indicated. This will be dependent on whether carotid disease is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Symptomatic has been defined as having a vessel lumen narrowing or stenosis in the presence of a history of stroke or TIAs. 
Class 1 evidence exists for patients undergoing granted endorectomy if they were symptomatic within 6 months, had non-invasive imaging documentation of greater than 70% luminal narrowing or catheter angiographic narrowing of greater than 50% and had an anticipated perioperative stroke or mortality rate of having less than 6%. In, the patient, in, the, in this group of patients, intervention is encouraged after 48 hours of stroke onset, but usually within two weeks of symptoms. And carotid artery stenting is a reasonable alternative in patients who are surgically unfavorable. Looking at an asymptomatic stenosis, in other words, those patients who have no prior history of stroke or TIAs, class 2 evidence exists that carotid endorectomy should be considered in patients with a stenosis of greater than 70% if the risk of stroke, MI and death is low, especially in the older patients. The best medical management for atherosclerotic disease has improved dramatically after the termination of these large trials for symptomatic and asymptomatic carotid stenosis. With the introduction of statin treatments, more effective and aggressive management of hypertension and the recognition of the importance of lifestyle changes to certain size, diet and smoking sensation. Therefore, best medical management should be implemented in all patients with carotid stenosis, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. I'm now going to look at the evidence base and recommendations for medical management for secondary stroke prevention in patients who suffered a TIA in which internal carotid artery stenosis or cardioembolic source has been excluded. The mainstay of medical management for secondary stroke prevention include antihypertensive therapy, antithrombotic therapy with antiplatelet agents for most stroke subtypes, or anticoagulants such as warfarin or the DOAX or direct oral anticoagulations for cardioembolic strokes specifically. Cholesterol lowering therapy, principally with statins and glycemic control to prevent microvascular complications from diabetes, is necessary. The stakes are high given that by some estimates, up to 80 to 90% of strokes are preventable. And this is where the primary healthcare practitioner acts as the cornerstone in risk stratification reduction. The importance of blood pressure control for stroke prevention cannot be overstated. It plays a major role in promoting atherosclerotic disease and is strongly associated with an elevated risk of stroke. The overall efficacy of blood pressure lowering therapy was largely driven by positive results from four clinical trials. PROGRESS randomly assigned 6,105 patients with a history of stroke or TIA to an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor with or without a diuretic in dapamide and reported a 28% relative risk reduction in recurrent stroke. PATS or the post-stroke antihypertensive treatment study randomly assigned 5,665 patients to high diuretic and in dopamide or a placebo and they reported a 29% decrease in recurrent stroke with treatment. Profess was a trial that evaluated the angiotensinogen 2 receptor antagonist Telmisartan in 20,332 patients with recent ischemic stroke which failed to show an overall benefit Possibly because many patients in the study already had lower blood pressures at baseline and the blood pressure reductions achieved with a single antihypertensive medication in this study were modest. And finally, we're moving to the intensive blood pressure goals which have been evaluated in the SPRINT trial. The systolic, which is short for systolic blood pressure intervention trial. This landmark trial was terminated early after demonstrating fewer cardiovascular events with intensive blood pressure lowering having a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 systolic compared to a standard blood pressure of less than 140 uh, millimeters mercury systolic. The reason why it was terminated early was because the difference in outcome was so significant that it became unethical not to treat the standard blood pressure control arm. The panel on the right shows the cumulative hazards for the primary outcome, a composite of myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, stroke heart failure, or death from cardiovascular causes. And for, the, and for death from any cause in the standard treatment arm was compared to the intensive treatment arm. In choosing an antihypertensive agent, the presence of concomitant conditions such as coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, or asthma should always be taken into account when you individualize therapy to these patients.
So moving on to antibacterial therapy, which continues to be the default antithrombotic approach for secondary stroke prevention for most stroke subtypes, including TIAs. Aspirin confers approximately 13% reduction in the relative risk for recurrent strokes based on a meta-analysis of patent therapy It was notably conducted done in the ISD and CAST trials. And then more recently, the Chance and Point trial enrolled similar patients drawn from the North America, Europe, Australia and New Zealand, presenting within 12 hours and randomly assigned patients to aspirin and clopidogrel compared to with aspirin and a placebo for 90 days. The loading dose of clopidogrel in point was 600 mg. Both studies found the benefit with short-term dual antibiotic therapy of aspirin and clopidogrel for 21 days in patients who suffered from a minor stroke or TIA. Lately, in a subgroup analysis of the Socrates trial as well as Thales trial, Ticagrelor was superior to aspirin in preventing of vascular events or death at 90 days in patients with ischemic strokes or TIA, which is quite promising results for future management in these patients. Moving on to statins, we all know that it's a class of medications that inhibit HMG coenzyme A, a key enzyme involved in cholesterol synthesis pathway. Sparkle demonstrated the benefit of high dose of fatorovastatin for patients with a history of stroke or TIA with a targeted low density lipoprotein or LDL level of less than 1.8 millimoles per liter. So diabetics is an important risk factor for stroke and current secondary stroke prevention guidelines recommend screening for diabetes in all of these patients. The recently reported SHINE or Stroke and Hyperglycemia Insulin Network Effort trial evaluated the effects of intensive blood sugar management with IV insulin compared with a sliding scale insulin administered subcutaneously on a 90-day functional outcomes after an ischemic stroke. No significant differences in functional outcomes or early recurrent strokes were seen, but the group who had was placed under tight glycemic control had worse functional outcomes at 90 days. For chronic management, the targeted HbA1c should be less than 7%. So going back to our case, Mr. Z, because the risk of recurrent stroke is highest in the first hours and days after a TIA, and by the fact that you don't know how long he's going to wait in the emergency department before he even gets his COVID results back. So you, then you decide to give him a loading dose of clopidogrel and dual antibiotic therapy, which is going to go on for 21 days. Based upon the secondary analysis from point, which I've discussed, uh, short-term dual antibiotic therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel will, do, will reduce the risk of recurrent stroke, even if it was initiated up to three days after symptom onset. But it's important to remember that at this stage it is only indicated in patients with TIAs and minor strokes. There are some upcoming trials looking at dual antibiotics in more severe stroke cases. Before I'm moving on to discuss the management of acute strokes and what is going to happen with our patient with the Z when he arrives in the hospital, I first want to look at stroke mimics and comedians. The term stroke mimic is an umbrella term rather than a diagnosis. The incidence of stroke mimic can be as high as 30%, but varies depending on the clinical setting. Seizure, syncope, migraine, space occupying, lesions, functional disorders, and metabolic conditions are the most frequent differential diagnosis of a suspected stroke. CT imaging can sometimes help us to identify some space occupying lesions. And then hyperglycemia is detectable with a bedside glucose monitoring. However, not all mimics are readily identifiable, as we all know. As I mentioned, by definition, any sudden onset of a neurological deficit could be a stroke, but it is important to identify the non-strokes, as treatment differs in this group. So, we can appreciate in this table, when comparing stroke mimics to a stroke, the, the time of onset is usually definite in a patient who had a stroke. The symptoms in a mimic category are usually non-focal and less severe when compared to a stroke. And then there is also commonly a history of reduced level of consciousness in the mimic category, which is hardly ever seen in strokes. Stroke symptoms are maximal mid onset, which is different to the mimics, and which progression of impairment is typically seen. And then commonly, strokes have relevant metabolic risk factors.
which the mimics might not have. So I thought this is quite a nice approach in patients with acute focal neurological fallout. So in theory, you could have four scenarios. So you could have a patient with a stroke or a patient without a stroke. And then you have patients that look like a stroke and those patients who don't look like a stroke. So by using this formula, we can see there are two scenarios that are relatively easy to identify. That is a stroke that looks like a stroke, like a 72-year-old male with an untreated atrial fibrillation with an acute onset aphasia and right-sided hemiparesis. And then the second scenario would be an individual with a lower motor cranial nerve 7 palsy, hyperacusis and taste impairment, or even a Saturday night palsy with a wrist drop. Therefore, it doesn't follow the common clinical features of a stroke. So the other two can be a little bit tricky as these are the patients that look like a stroke, but it's not a stroke. These are the so-called stroke mimics, and it is important to focus on these, as ideally you do not want to thrombolize these patients. And then you can get the stroke chameleons, where you initially thought the patient would have, have something else, but in the end it turned out that, that the patient did have a stroke. So the three most common stroke mimics to differentiate from is hypoglycemia, seizure with a TOTS, so if there's a history of positive motor movements, they should be higher up on your list of differentials. And then finally, migraineous hemiplegia. Other things that can sometimes also trick us, especially as the functional disorders. So in the brain attack study, they mentioned that mimics more likely in patients without traditional risk factors and strokes are more likely if the patients can give the exact time of onset. So stroke chameleons are also difficult. Typically, if there's no focal deficit, like if the patient did not have any hemiparesis, aphasia or apraxia, or an hemianopsia, then it is sometimes tricky to say whether the patient had a stroke or not. From stroke-based registries, up to 3% of strokes present with non-localizing features, like a delirium, acute onset dementia, or even a reduced level of consciousness. In cases where there are but especially, this occurs specifically in patients where there are bilateral thalamic infarcts affecting the reticular activating system, causing a drop in level of consciousness. Abnormal movements are rare, but it can also happen, like for instance in diabetic patients with lacuna strokes in the basal ganglia, causing hemicuria. Some strokes might look like a peripheral nerve system problem, for instance, posterior circulation symptoms presenting with vertigo, or a small stroke in the precental gyrus presenting with a pseudo radial nerve palsy. And then isolated headaches and visual symptoms can also be present in a stroke, but it's much more uncommon. But I think it's important to emphasize that a loss of consciousness is really a symptom of stroke, unless it's a severe form of stroke that knocks out that reticular system out on both hemispheres. Then it is possible to lose your consciousness. Okay, so let's get back to our case, Mr. Z. He now arrives in the emergency department. By luck, the hospital which he referred him to uses rapid COVID swaps and he gets his results within minutes. A CT scan is booked and he gets scanned. So now I want to discuss some treatment options available for hyperacute and acute strokes. Looking at thrombolysis, the inclusion criteria for patients that are eligible to receive treatment during the acute phase would include that you had your symptom onset within 9 hours. That includes the rapid assessment as well as a specialized CT scan with perfusion imaging to determine the size of the infarct core. can also be an MRI with DWI, DWI and flare mismatching as well as um, features to exclude absolute contraindications like an intracerebral bleed. Brain tissue is now becoming the issue and being able to correctly identify the amount of salvageable tissue represented by the penumbra is now rapidly becoming the standard of care. So for stroke treatment, we have a couple of options. We have drain power, which is a chemical used to dissolve blockages, which I'm going to talk about. And then we also have an option of mechanically removing the clots, which is now a highly rated topic in the stroke world. So moving on to the drain cleaner, we have TPA, which is a tissue plasminogen activator or alteplase, which is a, thrombo a thrombolytic drug which have been proven effective and approved for the use in acute stroke when giving IVI within four and a half hours since time of onset, or nine hours when specialized neuroimaging is available. There is a high level of randomized controlled data that supports its use, 
when given within the time frame and is really considered to be the standard of care. And if a patient is in a phasic or unable to consent, we as medical professionals are expected to provide this treatment since it is the only intervention we can give that has shown to reverse the symptoms of stroke. It is considered standard of care. So as I've mentioned, thrombolysis still remains the gold standard of care, especially in our setting. So the benefit of TPA is greatly mitigated by the time to treatment. So the longer you delay your treatment, the less the patient is going to benefit. And as we can see here, the odds of having an excellent outcome decreases over time and only crosses the no benefit line once five hours have been reached. But most centers don't treat beyond four and a half hours as the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage becomes too great. So at three hours of stroke onset, we can see that the number needed to treat um, is around eight to nine. Data supporting the use of TPA comes from the NINDS TPA stroke trial, as well as the ECAS trials, which randomized patients to excellent outcomes or not. So as we can see, they used a number of scales, but the absolute benefit ranges from 12 to 20%, and the number needed to treat to reach functional independence was as low as 5. So importantly, of course, is that this clot-busting medication does increase your chance for hemorrhage. And for symptomatic hemorrhage, which was fairly inclusive in definition, any neurological worsening or any neurological blood on the CT scan would be considered as being symptomatic. And as we can see, these patients who got TPA had a 6% increase when compared to patients who did not get TPA. But this risk is now being mitigated by selecting the patients that we want to administer TPA to. And once that four and a half hour threshold has been reached, Expanding our treatment window up to nine hours, minimizing the risk of symptomatic hemorrhage is now possible. So looking at the history of Alteplase, which is the second gen TPA that was first used in 1981 in a patient who had iliac vein thrombosis, who derived TPA from another patient with melanoma, which was successfully liased. The FDA approved TPA in 87 for acute myocardial infarctions and only in 96 after the successful completion of the NINDS and ECAS trials did it receive approval for the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. The mechanism of action I have simplified over here, but it is useful to know that TPA binds to fibrin-rich clots, gets activated and then transforms the plasminogen into plasmin, which will then break up that clot. TPA gets inactivated in the presence of plasminogen activated inhibitor. With that in mind, the main idea is to establish when the patient's last known period of being well it was. This was updated quite a bit as this can now include the patients within 9 hours of stroke symptom onset, strokes with unknown time of onset, as well as wake up strokes. The whole treatment paradigm is now shifting towards a tissue-based reperfusion strategy as opposed to the previous time-based strategies. Hence, tissue is now the issue, where neuroimaging, either by CT perfusion scans or MRI DWI flare mismatch, can accurately identify the salvageable tissue, thereby opening up a bigger window of opportunity in stroke patients. Therefore, we can now provide treatment for our stroke patients who present with a 9 hour from stroke onset, strokes of unknown onset, as well as wake-up strokes. I want to elaborate about the specific population group of unknown symptom onset or wake-up strokes. In the past, we typically would have only admitted them for a further stroke workup with secondary stroke prevention strategies. So the thought now is that these treatment strategies should be aimed to the amount of detectable mismatch on neuroimaging. This mismatch can be defined in several ways. It can be defined as a small core, but with a larger area at risk. It can also be defined as a mismatch between the core and the penumbra through DWI flared MRI imaging, which is currently being extensively investigated in numerous trials. So in the EXTEND trial, the majority of patients were enrolled using CT perfusion imaging. These patients were enrolled in up to 9 hours from stroke onset. 65% of these patients awoke from symptoms. In this study, they found that the majority of patients in the alteplase group had a functional outcome that was free from disability, so a modified ranking scale of 0 to 1 compared to only 30% in the control group. These findings were statistically significant.
The second trial used DWI flare mismatch on MRI studies, and Wake Up was a large trial which used no upper limit for last known well. So they entertained and enrolled these patients. The median NIHS stroke scale was 6, mostly being smaller strokes, and the last known time of well was up to 9 hours since the possibility of stroke onset. The primary outcome looked at similar to the prior study in which the modified ranking scale was 0 to 1. And they found that more patients who had freedom from disability if they received alter plays if then, uh, when it was compared to when they only received the placebo. Diffusion-weighted imaging, or DWI, and fluid attenuated inversion recovery, or flare sequences, can be seen here. DWI represents the ischemic penumbra and flare the core. From these images, we can appreciate a nice mismatch between the two. Hence, the patient is a viable candidate for TPA administration. When no mismatch is seen between DWI and flare sequences, a non-contrasted scan typically shows subacute appearing changes, which can be noticed here on the right. This images happen when these images are present. These patients typically don't benefit from any TPA administration anymore, and they are at a higher risk of developing complications. So, based on this literature, there were new recommendations added to the 2019 guidelines for the management of acute ischemic stroke, saying that alteplase can be beneficial if the time of onset is unclear or greater than four and a half hours from last known well or, who have had, or in patients with DWI and MRI lesions that are smaller than one third of the MCA territory and no visible signal changes on flare sequences. So going back to Mr. Z, a CT perfusion study was performed in him and it revealed a perfusion mismatch. The red areas represent the ischemic core and the green areas represent the penumbra. And from a number of calculations, it is deduced that he still has ample subvisual penumbra, which subsequently made him a candidate for TPA administration. So in summary, we can see that the IV thrombolytics is a very effective treatment in patients with acute ischemic strokes. But now with an extended time window and specialized neuroimaging imaging techniques, our spectrum to treat these patients are expanding. We can now analyze patients with stroke of unknown time of onset, wake up strokes or strokes with a nine hours. We should really try and catch them and act as fast as we can. So Mr. Z tolerated the TPA quite well, and after 30 days, his modified ranking scale was zero. It turned out that he had a 30% symptomatic ICA stenosis on the left with multiple other vascular risk factors. He continued his aspirin, a high dose of statin, and blood pressure was optimized to be kept less than 120 systolic. Great, and that concludes this talk. I hope it was informative and everybody learned something.